thank you very much uh, for that blessing. Blessed, uh, you know, they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So everything else is also inside the observer. That's, you know, what you hear, what you think, what you do, who you are. Kwame Abu says, greetings to all Ecosa Level 300 students of UDSWA campus and final year students of Prempe College. And it says, you know, from Bhakti, but it says Kwame Abu, I'm getting a bit confused here. Uh, Benito Maratino, you say you believe if Ghana takes that bold step in implementing the street naming project, it will boost our overall homeland security and will make accessibility really easy. And uh, Gabby Brown, you say that this morning's topic for the extraction beer is just, hmm. <laughs> I'm blessing you, Chipping, again and writing that it's very important to name the streets uh, of Ghana because it makes direction easy and it also helps you to identify places. Okay. Before we really delve into the street naming and the house numbering, and you know, try to link it to the president's expectations. I mean, he did say that he wants to see every street name and every house numbered in a particular time frame. But before we go into that, I'd like to take you know a little bit of a sideways glance at something that's been going on for quite a while. I'm talking about UN model conferences. Children getting together, trying to simulate or replicate what goes in the United Nations, and sometimes doing so well at it that they get international recognition. Now, one of such students is here with me. Yes, I know she's supposed to be in school, but uh, she seems to have taken some time off. Her name is uh, Aram. Aram, good morning. Welcome to Sunrise. How are you? Good morning. How, how old are you? I'm 13 years. 13 years old. All of 13. And what does QIS mean? I see that it's all over your blouse. What does QIS stand for? QIS stands for Queensland International School. Queensland International School. Is that your headmaster sitting right next to you? No, no, <laughs> no, of course not. That's Ernest. And Ernest is a man who works uh, with Lifelink. You can find him online, uh, lifelinkgana.org. And they've been doing this for quite a while. That is putting uh, UN model conferences together. Ernest, good morning. Welcome to Sunrise. Good morning. Okay, now, how did you get this idea to get you know children to simulate UN conferences? And wh what's the purpose of it all? Um, your first question. First, the whole idea came out um, about... Um, somewhere in 97, well, when I was in the university, I had the opportunity to participate in the Harvard Model event. And during that conference, I had a chance to see high school students from the states in New York doing a power simulation. Um, when I went into peep into the then I stood there and listened to them. At the time, I was in second year in Cairn USD. And I saw these kids um, simulating and talking about the Cuba Missile Crisis. I mean, I saw young people who basically are in more like primary school or junior high school. Then I tried to figure out how that was done. Because um, I was in I had never, I was a typical science student. I'd never known anything about what uh, international issues are stuck to my physics, chemistry, and mathematics. So I was surprised that children that age knew about what had happened during the Cold War and the way articulating these issues so well. So I decided to find out how it was done. Then I realized that it's, it's something that starts from an early age. And so they grow with it. And because they learn by doing, it becomes an easy process. So right after I university, okay. I decided to. So you thought it was a, a cool thing. Well, let me ask uh, Aram to answer the second question. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of this? I mean, what do you think is, uh, is the good thing about modeling the United Nations? So acting uh, like you are part of the United Nations? Modeling the United Nations, it's, it's a very great experience. Personally, I've been a shy person all my life. And when I got through this process, it taught me how to be confident. It taught me to speak up in public. It taught me a lot of things, how to relate to other people and also to know international issues. So this program is very good for people who want to get involved in foreign issues and also how to improve on your confidence. Now, how did you hear of this UN model conference? My teacher in school, she urged me in class five to start. Even though you were shy? Yes, wow. and I didn't really consider doing starting in class five. It was only when I got to form two that one of my friends participated and her experience was terrific, so I decided to join her. Well, come back to your terrific experience. But Ernest, you've been sending kids abroad for this. Uh, the last time it was 50 Ghanaian children. Aaron was one of them. And she actually won recognition for her contribution, for her level of participation. Tell me about the trip in general. Where did they go? What did they do? 
Right. Um, um, the whole process starts with a local conference, which we do on U United Nations Day here in Accra. And from there, we, selected, uh, we select outstanding students to participate in an international one, which comes over the UN headquarters in New York. So in those conferences, the kids get to sit in the seats in which the real ambassadors sit in. This year's conference was looking at about um, 1,550 students coming from around the world to simulate various organs of the UN system and representing different countries. The interesting thing about this model here, the ones you're Ghanaian, there's no way you're representing Ghana. You're definitely going to represent country aside from your country so that you step into the shoes of these ambassadors of these different countries. And you need to articulate the views of that country. <laughs> it's kind of like <laughs> a game. You're playing United Nations uh, premises, and you're actually sitting in the seats that you and ambassadors, you know, representatives will be sitting in. How do you select your participants? How do you select the children? I'm from the local conference in, in Accra. Um, um, we look at um, different, uh, we have a criteria for selecting. So the person's ability to play the role very well, your ability to write, because um, the skills in which you need to acquire, acquire is you need to learn how to draft or write something to call a position paper. That's more or less draft a speech yourself, which you should be able to deliver. And you need to do critical thinking and on the spot statements where when you are called upon, you should be able to, to make a statement on the subject under discussion. So these are skills that the kids acquire. And based on that, we select them. We have about 400 students uh, each year participating, but we need to scale it down because we are only given about 42 slots in the UN system. But due to our excellent participation over the years, um, anytime we ask for extra uh, spots in the model UN, the grantors, we seem to be the only Africans in there. And any time we get there, we make our, our presence felt. Were you surprised when you were selected, Aram? No, I wasn't surprised. You weren't surprised? Or you, were ex you, you think that you are you're an ambassador in the making, or maybe the UN Secretary General? Yes, I've always had aspirations. Really? Yeah. Even though you are shy? Even though I'm shy. OK, so were you surprised when you got recognition as a result of your participation? Well, I was a bit surprised when I got recognition. Ah, because uh, that, one, that one was international. Yes. It was Locally, you think, you know, you are the next, you know, Ghana female UN Secretary General. When you actually got to the National Nations, you say, wow, you know, I must be really good. Tell me, how did you get your recognition? What did you actually do to earn it? At the um, UN conference, Model UN conference, I didn't get to read my position paper, but I talked during moderated caucuses, which is when they gave a topic and each speaker has time to debate on this topic. I had to speak about four times each moderated caucus. During unmoderated caucuses, I negotiated with other countries. I got signatures and sponsors for my resolution. And in the end, my resolution passed, and everyone was so happy. So that's how I got recognition. What was the essence of your resolution? What, what were you proposing? We're proposing reduction of emission of fossil fuels from airplanes and also taxing tourists tourist companies in the countries and focusing more on historical and cultural tourism because I personally I think ecotourism is being abused in Africa mostly so if we focus more on historical and cultural tourism it can go a long way to improve on the tourism in Africa. Those are like very grown up things for a 13 year old person to be worrying themselves with. Did you did you give any help in uh, Hon honestly, uh, honestly, I mean, how much help do the do the participants get? Um, it's the training. Once we walk them through the training, the training starts with basic use of computer because that's you are sitting in Ghana. If you assign a country like Botswana or Timor Leagues, there's no way you can get there, especially when you don't have the embassies here. So the internet is the basic tool. So the first um, set of the training we walk them through is you, you need to go to internet basics. That will show you how to. Then we go to research skills. Then I teach them how to write position paper, how to deliver it. Then I teach you how to resolution writing. Then the main thing is that the UN rules of procedure, which is the key thing. Once you do not understand the rules of procedure, you cannot contribute in the debate. At any time, maybe you want to speak. If you don't go on the correct point, the chair or whoever is moderating is going to shut it down. So when I walk them through that, the sky is the limit for each of them. You look very serious, you know, the way you are sitting in the air. <laughs> what are you thinking about? Are you remembering uh, what happened uh, on your last trip, or are you thinking forward to when you think you might be the next UN Secretary General? 
I'm just thinking for it. You're thinking for it? Yeah. And wh what are you thinking, seriously? What, uh, what are you going to do next? From here, I'm going to participate in the high school model union conference. And hopefully, I'll start internship at the United Nations. And I'll build my career as a foreign ambassador. Now, where do all these uh, thoughts come from? Are these things that your parents or Ernest sort of like, you know, gave you on a silver platter or pumped into your head? Or did you come up with this all by yourself? I came up with this. I've been interested in foreign issues and foreign matters for all my life. And I worry my parents about it all the time. So it's something that I came up with myself. Very impressive. I'm finding it, you know, like quite a challenge just to keep up with you. What was it you said? The reduction in the emission of uh, fossil fuels for airlines? Historical and cultural tourism, and what was the third one? And taxing tourist sites. And taxing tourist sites. Okay. Are all the children who participate in your programs uh, as smart as Aaron? Yes. yes. Once you walk through the basic training, I mean, they, they know how to go about it at any, at any point in time. Whatever the issue is, they know how to tackle it. What the issues are, how do you solve it? What are conventions and UN uh, processes that have been initiated to solve that? So once they are aware of that, they know how to get around information and supply any information you need. And some, most of the time, do on-the-spot thinking is what is critical. Maybe we've seen um, kids like Mordecai, Papayao, and all those kids that we've produced. And the interesting part of it is that most of the time when they live here, if you go to all the secondary schools and even some of the junior SMs, they are the people who participate in are those in leadership position go to Wesley Girls, Fantapen, or the school prefects and all the top prefects are products from this modern young process. Now how important is the background of a child uh, to their chances of being selected? I'm asking this yes. question because we know that we have this gap between the yes. less endowed schools and the better endowed schools, the more prosperous you know family backgrounds yes. and the relatively yes. poorer ones. Right. How important is yes. money in this? Fudge, um, last year, um, we had a chance, before the president passed away, we had a chance to meet him on our trip to the United States. And at that time, they had supported a program where we do this in deprived communities. It's unfortunate that there was one, two of them from deprived communities, but when they are in Nyene Nyene somewhere, so we could, he was actually the one I wanted to get here to prove a point that it didn't really matter what your background is. Once you have these basic stuff like the use of the internet, the use of the computer. Any kid from any part of the country should be able to do this. So we had one who actually went, and I thought you we were going to screen the video. You'd have seen one of them that um, was interviewed when we were in New York. We came from Yenene, it's a remote area in the, somewhere in the BBN area, where we went to run training for about 40 students from those areas to come into the company. And we picked two of them to the model UN conference in New York, and you should have seen them being so articulate in the General Assembly chamber. Somebody coming from way by a village in Ghana, but because he's had the basic skill and the tools and the training that we walked them through, he's used just as good as all the international participants that were there. Who are your role models, Aram? Do you look up to uh, anyone in the sphere of politics, in the sphere of uh, private business, perhaps uh, philanthropy, charity, as a, as a role model? Who, do you, who would you like to model your life, your values on? Donald Trump. Donald Trump? You know, I thought you were going to say Kofi Annan. Why Donald Trump? Donald Trump, is his life story is very phenomenal. He and you like his hairstyle? Yeah. <laughs> 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 he started out as a crack addict. He was so messed up. But he found he could do make way better things. And from there, he started investing, and he owns almost half of the buildings in New York. And he has a huge company. He's an, uh, he's an entrepreneur. He, he does TV programs. And he's just making it big. And it just goes to show that no matter what happens, if you just find your way, you'll make it. So he's, he's my role model. OK, now, earlier on, as you were saying that uh, money is not really a key factor. So who bears the cost of uh, grooming the children, of selecting them in the first place, then grooming them, then transporting them to s the UN headquarters in, in New York, bring them back, and so on and so forth? Who pays for all of this? Right, as I said, um, for those in the, we have two categories of the whole model process. One for specifically for deprived communities and 
um, together with the Ministry of Communication, the use of the what we call the community information centers. That's what we are building the ones for deprived communities on. Um, these areas are selected places where the Ministry of Communication, together with the KFEC, has something we call the community information centers where they have some like internet set up where people can access. We are using that as um, um, to enhance our model UN in the rural communities. So for that, the UNDP together with the Ministry of Communication supported to run the training locally in these areas selected, of not all of them, but anytime, every year we do about four of them in each of the communities. So we have support from the UNDP to do that. Then with the ones for Accra and the, those who are privileged and can apply, they pay a fee for, for the training. Now when it comes to our international travel, every year we have sponsorship for five uh, delegates. Those are standing in the whole conference, which we have support from KLM, Royal Delta Alliance, and some other companies who give us support for those. Apart from this, um, they give us discounted first for the rest of um, the delegation, then they need to seek some other support, either from their parents or for organizations who want to support them to participate as well. I've just uh, posted the link, uh, the URL, the website address of LifeLink Ghana. You can see it amongst uh, the posts of everyone who's joined our page on Facebook and has participated in this morning's episode, uh, including Emmanuel Prempe, Felix I. I want, I want to thank everyone who's uh, posting. I'll be sure to read through your posts and read some of them out loud. Aaron, what was uh, the best part of your experience uh, in all this? Like, was it in Ghana? Was it in New York? Which, which part of the whole thing do you remember most and think that, yes, this is something that you remember for the rest of your life? What I remember most was after the Ghana conference, I realized I was my performance wasn't top notch. I wasn't talking, so I realized I have to talk. I have to speak up. I have to show these people what I'm made of. So when I went to the New York conference and I started speaking up, I was confident, and I realized that's it. If I continue doing this one day, I realize my dream. So that's the moment I remember. It was like my eureka moment. That was that was just the perfect moment for me. The perfect moment. Are you always this perfectly serious, or will your friends who are watching you right now say, "Ah, look at her. She's sitting there, you know, sounding so serious and intelligent. Actually, she's always smiling, and she's not that shy at all." I'm always this serious. People always this say serious. I never smile. You never smile. <laughs> Why is that? But you're smiling now, look. <laughs> <laughs> or is it because I'm funny? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know people laugh at me, like they say, you know, you're so funny, you're, you're not serious, you should be more serious. Do you think that this is something that uh, you would encourage everyone of your age or even younger to try? I would encourage everyone of my age to try. It's a very good experience. It will build your confidence. You know a lot of things around the world. You relate better to other people. You know how you know how to write position papers. You know a lot about the UN procedures, and you will discover a lot of things about yourself when you go for this conference. So I would encourage it for everyone, every young person. But how can this help people have better lives? Many would say, "Well, it's all well and good, but what we really need is maybe more water, or safer roads, or better jobs, or better paying jobs." How do you think? the United Nations, what goes on in the United Nations, and what your interest in that could possibly do to help us all have better lives. As a young person, your interest in the United Nations can go a long way because the United Nations upholds the voice of children very much. And if you have interest in the United Nations, you get to know how to solve problems, how to debates on world issues and through this young people can come up with solutions for some of the complicated problems around the world and for all you know the the united nations general assembly can take those solutions up and it can help the countries a lot so young people's voices are heard a lot at the united nations so if we take interest in this we debate on world issues we find solutions that can be used to enhance countries okay well since you brought children up and since you told me earlier on that you chose some really interesting uh, themes 
for your uh, for your delivery, your proposals. I want to ask you this: Why didn't you focus on the needs of children in Ghana? For example, when it comes to education, when it comes to the rights of children, lots of children get abused, lots of children are deprived, lots of children who don't have parents are even more vulnerable. Why didn't you choose to represent children in Ghana? Well, my topic was on tourism. Yes. But in the Ghana conference, we looked at ensuring a peaceful future for children through democratic governance. And through that topic, we debated on how democracy can be used to create a peaceful atmosphere for children. And through that, we saw solutions as to how to provide better facilities, better, better environments for children. And it was, it was a nice experience. We got solutions for some of the problems around us. Are these, are these the sort of things that you talk about with your friends in between classes or during vacations or when you're on the phone? They say, well, you know, what, uh, what can we do to improve uh, the reduction of, uh, of fossil fuel emissions from jet liners? Or, you know, what can we do to improve historical and cultural tourism? What I'm asking is, uh, are your friends also interested in the same things? Yes, my friends are also interested in as well. Very, very interesting. Very <laughs> Why are you looking at me laughing like that? Isn't it? Uh, you've obviously, you know, you've, you've obviously scored well. You say that you have lots more uh, talent that is of the same caliber, perhaps, you know, slightly different. So do you think that there is, uh, th there is hope for us in the future when it comes to the way uh, our children represent yeah. uh, Ghana at the UN Model Conferences? Yes, there, there is hope for us. Um, the interesting part is that once you get them to the basic um, training and give them the green light as to what is expected. And most of the, the focus of their discussion change. You get them text me or call me, especially when they are global issues. When the last time there was that threat from North Korea, I got some of the mother um, and alumina, those who are partners, calling me that, do I think it's going to happen? What should we do? Don't, don't I think that council needs to meet immediately to avert a nuclear crisis? You know? So they become abreast and always want to know about global issues. You get them calling you to fa find out that Uncle Ernest, what? What do I think about this situation? Do, don't you think so? The focus of the discussion changed. And when you go to the Facebook pages, most of the time they either speak in UN language and always trying to comment on something that's going on around them each, each of the time, whether it's the situation in Ghana or outside the country. They, they understand what the whole picture globally and always know what to say and what do you think the solutions are to those problems. Hmm. Well, Joshua Foray is very impressed with it. He says uh, he wants to know what the base categories are for selecting people. <laughs> he says he's got a sister who is really interested in such uh, issues. Michael Giovanni says uh, he's really impressed with you, uh, Aram. And he says, you know, keep it up. You will achieve your goals. And he's asking you, Ernest, to come to more places with your program. He's writing to us from Bato in the Volta region. Uh, Kwesi Asari Chua Jr. says, good luck to all and Abugis Wasi candidates. Uh, once again, I've posted the link, uh, the URL, the page, uh, web page address for LifeLink Ghana. Uh, Felix, I think that um, you've got the brains of Einstein. Albert Einstein is just praying that you don't lose track of your future as you get into your teens. Uh, blessing thanks. you're really good, likes you, and uh, he wants to know which part of Ghana you are from, or she wants to know. And Emmanuel Prempa is moving on to our next uh, issue. So the issue of street naming brings back the memories of the late Baridu who wanted to use Asante Akimagogo to portray that Ghana can do it. This will help solve a lot of security issues and emergencies of crime, for example, fire outbreaks, and so on and so on. says that this is what people with money should use their resources for to educate children so that we can all be responsible. I've really enjoyed my conversation with Ernest and Aram, and if you have, let them know. Just post your thoughts and comments to the page of TV3 Sunrise on Facebook. Coming up, the topic of street names and house numbers. How important is it? How can we achieve it? What can we learn from some of our ECOWAS neighbors or other parts of the world, and why? Keep watching Sunrise. Mm -hmm. 